Good morning. Please welcome on Czech Technical University in Prague. Uh, for today, we prepare two lectures. First speaker will be uh, Honza Plachy, who will introduce uh, networks of 5G, 6G, 7G, 8G, <laughs> and more. And second speaker will uh, be Dennis, uh, Dennis Rozume, who will, who will uh, introduce his work and possibilities how to how to uh, break into the world of science. Uh, after two lectures, uh, you, will, uh, you will visit three labs and you will see a lot of interesting stuff. So, Honza, please. So thank you for a warm introduction. So as I as you said, uh, my name is Sam Plachy. I'm from 5G Mobile Research Lab, and I was speaking about 5G and beyond, basically 6G, 7G, and maybe future. But we are not there yet, but slowly getting there. So uh, just to briefly introduce us, we are a small lab over here at Czech Technical University in Prague. Uh, we have few prof some professors, uh, PhD students, researchers and also uh, several students, bachelor and masters. We collaborate with multiple companies and universities, just to make a picture of us. And over here, you can see basically the research areas where we basically work on. So we work on, for example, like general communication of users, resource allocations, handovers, so where you are moving throughout the city, uh, you always get the best channel that you can. Uh, D2D communication, for example, is there someone who knows what is it? D2D communication or device to device communication? It's basically direct communication between you two phones or even multiple. You can use, actually you, you reuse them for even uh, purposes such as relaying. So for example, if you are in a bad coverage, for example, in subway, you can exploit someone else to get a great channel quality. We also focus on uh, vehicular communication, which is really interesting right now, and we have some companies working on it. And also uh, this mobile edge computing, which I will introduce later. Maybe some of you may already figure out what, what is this about. And the flying base stations, which we have over here, and I will speak uh, at the end. So before going to the architecture, over here we have some kind of overview of the architectures or let's say more of a mobile networks from the point of uh, mobile phones, which basically some of you may, or you may already know, I think this 4G, you know, maybe 3G, I don't know about, is there someone who knows this phone from 2G? Yeah, someone knows? How about, how about 1G? <laughs> yeah, like this. So uh, first G was introduced roughly in 1981 and basically it enabled you to do uh, communication over air and just you can just transmit uh, the analog voice then the 2G came and you could actually use some uh, simple data transmissions not much but you can actually try to connect to not the www but uh, something called WAP then with 3G mobile broadband so you can actually connect to the internet use some mobile services but still you were kind of limited by uh, the data rates that you can achieve then came 4G, which I think most of you already have or and are looking maybe to 5G, which will be soon there. But first, let's stick with 4G a bit. So it, when it started, it was all about data, which I will mention also later. Uh, the thing is that you don't transmit the voice as it is. Everything is transmitted over internet protocol. And the mentioned 5G is basically extending 4G to 5G, so we have more, more devices. Uh, higher data rates and so on. And let's say, we, I think we can expect it around 2020. There's already some, let's say, testing networks uh, which were deployed last year. This year, there will be more of them. But around 2020, we can expect more networks to be deployed. So 4G. Yeah, one more thing. Uh, if 5G, it's expected a standardization in uh, that there was standardization with uh, 3GPP, I think you have not heard about it, but it's an organization which basically standardizes all the processes. There are companies, research centers, which basically want to push their ideas and bring better connectivity to you. So first phase was already completed uh, last year, and the next one with the new radio and the, well, the extended new radio and some interesting stuff will be released uh, next year. So now moving to 4G. 
uh, when basically 4G started, uh, you, was, you were told that there, it is a LTE. It actually is not LTE. It started with uh, LTE-A, this LTE Advanced. Because as I was speaking about standardization, the LTE doesn't fulfill all requirements. So actually true, true 4G is the LTE-A. It's something similar which you may have seen in the US where the one operator deployed 5G-E. It's not 5G, it's 4G, but they wanted to make it sound nice. So uh, the communications occur over something like this, like these rectangles, using uh, orthogonal communication. I think from mathematics you may know what some orthogonal vectors are, right? So what does it mean if something is orthogonal? <laughs> Don't worry, just, just try to express it by your words. So basically, if I, for example, have one vector in this direction, like this, the second one would go, for example, up. So the thing is that uh, you reduce interference, which means basically when you are communicating, you don't interfere with each other. So for example, in 1G, there was this, in basically 1G was through the issue because you, are, you have to also fine tune the radio and over here, everything is done automatically. Then as mentioned, you have this IP-based communication. I think all of you know Skype, right? So uh, the, the data that you transmit over Skype are not transmitted uh, as a voice, as I'm basically speaking over here, but they are digitalized and transmitted. And this is because all the 4G is based on internet protocol. Uh, then there are some proximity services, as I mentioned, the D2D communications, uh, machine time communications, because even uh, machines want to communicate with other, let's say, friends or data centers and collect data. You have uh, narrowband IoT, so uh, like measuring uh, weather and so on. Unassigned, spe uh, unassigned spectrum, because right now basically everything is regulated. You have to buy spectrum, pay a lot of money for it and use it. So you can also use unassigned. But the thing is that uh, you have to really work because it's something like Wi-Fi where uh, there's no regulation. And vehicular communication, also uh, upcoming trend. And over here is the architecture. Just brief some, like, let's say, just focus on these two blocks. We have EU tram, basically the radio part. We have those UEs, these are user equipments, those are your phones. We have E node B or e H E N B, basically the base stations and antennas that you can see around. And then the core network of the operator, which you actually don't see. So this is kind of like for you to make a picture or make it in mind how to, how to visualize how it actually works and looks like. So moving from 4G to 5G, there must be some motivation, right? Because why, why to stick with 4G if, uh, if basically if it doesn't provide everything that we want? So uh, there are various types of devices that communicate, your phones, sensors, cars, which also will, for example, for autonomous driving, you will really need to have a reliable communication. And the uh, thing is that the communication is different. It's kind of like mix of traffic. So it's not just uh, playing games uh, or watching YouTube, but sending some small data and uh, expecting really low latency. Also varying requirements in time and space. For example, uh, before you came, there was no one. So basically there was basically just me and a few, few other people. And we didn't need to communicate. But right now, maybe the presentation can be a bit boring. So you may watch YouTube. But the network has to be uh, basically optimized for this case and adapt it. So when you come, the network must provide the connectivity over here. And for this, basically, we have three uh, kind of like use cases or main areas for which the 5G targets. So if enhanced mobile broadband, this is most interesting for you because you want to have uh, higher data rates basically to stream, not uh, let's say full HD, but 4K videos and so on. Then massive machine type communications, like tens of thousands, even more devices communicating. And this ultra reliable and low latency communications. For if you, I don't know if you heard about some remote uh, medical op procedures, like uh, this is kind of like tactile internet where you actually really need, it has to be like extremely reliable. Because if for example, a doctor is operating brain remotely and he makes wrong, um, let's say there's some delay or unexpected delay, he can make move and the machine at the, at the, end, at the, at the uh, other end can make something different. 
and it can, in the end, it can even kill the patient. So 5G vision, low latency, and a fully flexible network, which is where we're heading. Basically, everything is kind of like softwareized, and also uh, efficient spectrum use, because the spectrum is a finite resource, and in, uh, you can you have or let's say limited resources. For example, you have if you have a pool of water, and you can fit all, uh, there's a finite number of uh, people that can fit in. Machine learning and artificial intelligence. Well, right, right now, they are kind of like buzzwords, but they're actually being used for, for those technologies, especially for 5G, because in 4G, you could tweak parameters maybe by hand, but in 5G, it's basically almost impossible to do. So you need to use some, uh, some computers doing it by themselves, which leads to self-optimizing networks. And at the end, I will show you some uh, example of what we do with it. Augmented and virtual reality. I think you know what this means. You have right now lots of games. You have, for example, even in industry, people using these headsets, for example, for uh, having a look at, uh, like visualizing your new flat, new house, car, and so on. And industrial wireless communications as well. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, he was working on a project with Airbus, and I think you know, have you ever, so is there someone who have not flown before? Don't worry, just raise your hand, <laughs> I won't bite. So everyone flew, everyone has been in an airplane. Okay, great. So you know, it's a complicated system, it's quite huge, and you need to be able to uh, collect information, for example, about wings or flaps or so on. And some information can be like beneficial, but not 100% necessary. And for that, uh, if you do it in, the, let's say, the old way, you have to basically uh, take a cable and bring it to the sensor. You need to check it and so on. And it costs a lot of money. But what you can actually do, you can use wireless communications. You can deploy wireless sensors, kind of like IoT, to collect the data from those sensors. And you can save a lot of money. OK, so now we go for 5G architecture. It's not very much different for, for 4G. So these are your phones. This is the so-called radio access network. So you're communicating with the base stations. With 4G, and the base stations were called E node B, this E and B. In 5G, they are called G node B. And then over here at the top, you have core. The thing is that the 4G and 5G can cooperate. So you can either use uh, communicate through 4G, through 5G with help of uh, 5G, or through fully 5G network, or even uh, 4G can exploit the 5G. So it's about basically being able to reuse what's already there. And uh, closer look in the architecture. So again, your phone, the radio access network, the base station, and there's a major difference between 4G and 5G. Because right now, if you communicate, the operated, all data that you transmit go through the core network. So from your phone, through the base station, to core, and through the internet. In 5G, only some data, so the control data and only some necessary data will go through the core, uh, through the core network, the rest will go directly to the internet. So this is one of the ways how you can reduce the communication latencies and we can actually enable the tactile internet. In 5G, there are some uh, say changes in the physical layer, but not that major. So you're using the still orthogonal frequency division multiplex, as, you, as I shown the rectangle at the beginning. And you are using some modulation and coding schemes. Which I think uh, you, it, it may not make sense for you, but you can uh, have a look at it. So it's kind of like real axis and imaginary axis, so basically complex numbers, which you, can, which you actually transmit over network. And the better the channel, so uh, let's say uh, you, are sure you are closer to the base station, the higher modulation you can exploit, so more of those points will be there, and you can enjoy higher data rate. Then in the 5G, uh, millimeter waves or let's say higher frequency bands will be used. So you can use, so we are, right now we are communicating, let's say below uh, four, 4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz. And in 5G, we're communicating 10 gigahertz, 30, 60, even more. Basically, th th there are some issues, for example, with uh, some uh, weather predictions where they get the data. But if you tweak it right, there should, not be no, there should be no interference, so you can use it without any problem. Or communication via visible light communication. For example, right now, those lights, maybe some of them are LED, light emitting di diodes. 
through which you can actually communicate. So you just put your phone on the table and you can communicate with the light. And as a, basically, several all the 5G is a lot of both uh, reducing the communication latency. So right now, if you communicate, it takes a long time. So for that, you have those, let's say, frames, kind of like defined unit over which you communicate, and we are reducing it. And also, there is an issue in 4G. If you communicate, stop communicate, and want to start communicating again, it takes a lot of time. Because you, you have to go through, let's say, multiple kind of like states in which your phone is. But in 5G, it's reduced, so you can, there is a new state uh, introduced. It's called uh, IRC Connected Inactive. And from this, to go to Connected, so enjoy the data, data communication, it's much faster. Now, uh, if, let's say from 1G to 4G, everything was uh, basically about hardware. But with 5G, we are moving outside from some specific hardware to some generalized hardware. It's kind of called the network function virtualization. And so in 4G, for example, it's I think 4G base station. This is the hardware with which you are communicating right now. Specific hardware, quite costly. But in 5G and 6G and basically beyond, you will not use this specific hardware, but you will go to generic PCs and use software-defined networking or radio. And then basically you can run the whole network on, for example, on your home computers. I'm speaking, I was said something about software-defined networking and a radio. I think uh, for most of you, it may not make much, much sense or can be like a strange word, but uh, so defined networking is basically that you have, for example, a computer, you connect the cables, and the, the computer uh, basically defines via software how you want to route the packets or send them where you want to send them. And software defined radio is the other side. So you have something, for example, like this. This is a software defined uh, radio board which enables us to basically connect antenna, get the radio signal, change it to digital one, do some processing, and then uh, do the rest on the computer, which is shown over here as this small one. It's so basically this one, this board is within it. And uh, network slicing. As I was speaking about different requirements for networks, uh, you can do it in a way that every user, for example, smartphones, automotive, and IoT devices, which will have a slightly different communication type. So if you communicate, if you communicate via your smartphone, uh, the network will behave slightly different. And everything is uh, basically done via software. And this basically, this softwareization leads to network uh, cloudification. Because right now you have a lot of, uh, let's say, computers in the corner network, which are maybe not of all the time are used 100% or 80%, it depends how you design it. But you can do some load balancing. For example, if one computer is more utilized, you move the load to the other one. You can use it also for network control, but not just for that, but also for users, which I will speak next before going through a cloud radio access network. So uh, this, I think you can, right now you can understand what is this. So you have a user, you have a base stations, you have core network, and this BBU pool is basically the computation resources which, uh, through which are these base stations connected. And this enables us to uh, reduce the communication cost, enable ultra-dense deployment, so uh, you can achieve actually the, the higher data rates you can communicate uh, via light or using millimeter waves. And now, it's this, I think this may be more interesting for you, because this is not for the operator, but it's actually for you to use. It's called multi-access edge computing or mobile edge computing. Is there someone who knows what, what is this? Cloud computing, does it ring a bell? Someone, maybe, maybe someone else? Are you using uh, Dropbox or some Google services? Microsoft services like Office Online? No? Okay, so basically, this means that uh, your computer is in the cloud. You, you via your phone or net, uh, your notebook, you can connect somewhere far away and use the computation resources over there. But the thing is, right now, most of those clouds are located far away. For example, right now we are in Prague and we can be using some computers which are located in, for example, in Paris or London or even farther away. 
But the thing is that it introduces a let's say quite long latency. So for example, if you were to using some some other like game or something, it would not be playable because of that. So we are multi uh, multi access edge computing. You are bringing the, those computational resources uh, closer to you to the so called edge. That's why it's called mobile edge or multi access mm -hmm. edge computing. So you have these computational resources uh, at the base stations, and you can use it for computation of loading. So if you basically take your, let's say some application on your phone and run it in the cloud or run it on a device, for example, this is kind of like some, uh, let's say, outdated, bit of outdated device, you can compare also the energy and save the energy, prolong your battery life. Because that's it's quite important because right now, if you basically charge your phone in the morning and in, let's say, maybe even in the afternoon, you have to charge it again. And you can use it in various applications. For example, computation demanding applications, maybe some even research, let's say. You can use it for augmented reality. For example, we have developed an application, which is shown over here, which shows you some points of interest around you. And you can take basically the location of the device where you are looking, send it to the server, and it will return you what you can actually see. Or even Pokemon Go, which I think all of you know, right? Yeah. And this was kind of like 5G, but now we're moving, let's say, beyond 5G with future mobile networks. Over here, we have uh, let's say, a huge crowd of, uh, of users. So to provide co coverage for them, we, we deploy some base station or base stations. So since one is not enough, we have to deploy more and more, right? But what then do users move? So what would you do? A tricky question, but an easy answer, right? Someone, what did you do? Three? Yeah, you can put new ones. But the thing is that users can move again and again and again. And those base stations, they are quite costly. So most of the time, for example, these would be utilized, whereas these would be basically unutilized. No one's connected, no one's using them. So if you have a high number of uh, users, you need to deploy a high number of say, small cells, which are costly, or you can use uh, the flying base station, which is over here, which can basically fly around, follow the users. So this is basically just a common, let's say, UAV or a drone, which can basically take this. Is basically this box is the communication payload. Through this, we can actually communicate. And over here, it looks. Then it looks like this. We have a base station to which uh, the flying base station is connected, and it provides connectivity to your phone or even sensors. It basically can be any arbitrary device which has communicating abilities. Now, there are some scenarios where it is beneficial. For example, some emergency scenarios. But we are focusing more on some scenarios for the users. For example, scenario where you have a stadium, you have users coming in, and they're coming from multiple directions. They come mostly in crowds. So what you do, you use the flying base stations to provide connectivity to users before they get to the stadium. Then if it's uh, open stadium, they, the drones can basically land on top of that and provide con connectivity to devices, to users. So for example, if there are like 30,000 of people, even more, the infrastructure even deployed on the, on the stadium may not handle it. So you can improve the communication capabilities over there. And then after the match, basically again, you have devices moving in crowds outside, you provide the connectivity to them. Another scenario can be some traffic jams in uh, basically vehicular communication, or even just basically you get stuck somewhere and suddenly there, have, there is a lot of people communicating and the, basically the deploy base stations cannot handle it. Then also, for example, you have some uh, sport and social events where it really makes sense. Uh, I will go a bit through some technical details. I will, some I will skip, but just to give you a quick overview, how does it work? So we have uh, communication on the drone, the box below, and over there, there are, I think there are, right now there are, uh, the antennas are taken down through which you communicate. There are, let's say, roughly uh, really light, below 100 uh, grams. You have communication interface, which is a small version of the 
this software defined radio, like on a credit card side, this provides basically the, almost the same uh, capabilities as this board, but it's much smaller. Then you have uh, some hardware running uh, the software, which over here, which is basically done via a small PC. You have some uh, batteries, and total weight is uh, slightly below one kilo. And as it is right now, with the battery, uh, it can basically stay in the air for around 20 minutes. You can also put there another one, extend it to 40 minutes. But our primary goal is not to develop the power source and this stuff, but focus on communications. And for that, it's enough. But if you want to deploy it, there are some hydrogen-powered cells, which can actually keep this air in the air for two and a half, three hours, even more. And how to exploit it? Again, core network, some baseband units, base stations, and the flying either relay station or uh, the actual base station itself. So what you do, you can either deploy it as a relay station, kind of like mirroring the signal, or standalone base station. And I will show you a bit of results to, to prove that it makes sense. So over here in this figure, we have a number of users running from 0 to 1,000 and the relative throughput. It's relative to this one, this red line. This is one base station, one flying base station. And we start with one uh, common base station, two base stations. This is the relay station five uh, base stations and 10. And it can actually replace up to 10 base stations. And also, it can improve uh, energy efficiency. So it saves your battery on your phone. Then you can, for example, have uh, more, more moving users and multiple base stations which are flying around. We are actually using uh, some machine learning or evolution algorithms for it. Over here, just some results. It can reduce uh, the energy consumption by a quarter and improve the network data rate by 200%, which is quite a lot. Enables communications in uh, higher bands as well, so we can actually use the millimeter waves or the visible light communications. And this is kind of like moving beyond 5G. And if we go really to 6G, then we have some satellite communications. It can provide connectivity not just in rural areas, for example, where there basically there's basically no infrastructure at all, but it can provide the, uh, the big hole through the uh, base stations or flying base stations because this needs to be connected somehow to the internet because that's where you want to go. Even higher frequencies, like hundreds of gigahertz, from tens to hundreds, this enables us to use uh, wider communication bandwidths. So, for example, instead of I don't know, like communicating over one gigabit per second, you can go to 100 gigabits per second. Artificial intelligence, which is uh, right now really stressed and exploited, and will be even more for uh, some self-control. For example, even the design of antennas. It's really a nice tool because you just specify what you want to do, and then the computer tries to figure it out what's the optimal way how to do that. If you are interested in this, you can, at the open day, there is a showcase where my colleagues shows it. Actually, you can try to design more, uh, better, even better antenna than the computer does. Higher spectral efficiency. Uh, the spectrum is limited, so you need to uh, improve the way how you communicate to be, able to be able to use what you already have more efficiently. So there are some technologies which can exploit it. And over here, just to put it in the numbers so in 2015 we had uh, 15 exabytes per month transmitted a huge number exabyte but still in 2023 it will grow almost 10 times so this is why we still need to work on it why we cannot stay with 4g or even 5g but we need to keep on keep going on and last but not least some students work which may be interesting for you so one of my students was working on the self-optimizing network. Basically, had the phone and tried to optimize the transmission power of the device so we can save the battery life. And the network basically uh, learned it by itself. Another one where we used uh, game theory. I don't know if you are familiar with it, but it's basically you have some users they are playing against each other to be able to either obtain the collective goal or if they are selfish, to be best for themselves. For example, best communication channel and the highest data rate. So that's it. So if you have some questions, you can go ahead and ask.
Thank you. So before you think about the questions, I will show you a short video of the drone flying. I think that may be the most interesting stuff. So this is the base station to which the flying base station over here is connected. We are providing the connectivity. Uh, right now, there is uh, some uh, pilot, which was basically controlling where it should fly. But right now, we are almost done with automatic positioning. So it can uh, basically just uh, fly where it figures out where is the best, best position. And there should be another video in the air. We actually tested it uh, over here in, inside the, uh, let's say outside the building, but inside the campus. So it flew up and we were connecting and streaming some data just to see that it actually works. And this is kind of stuff that uh, we include the students in. So this was basically, or actually the work of uh, four students, master students. Right now we had uh, another two, two master students working on it and others are coming. So if you're interested, this is the stuff that you can actually work on and much more. Okay, so thank you again. I hope that you enjoy it and we'll move to the next presentation. Thank you.